Um, thank you very much for the chance to speak. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, a project that uh, is an extension of my work with uh, Owen Gulliam in his last talk, um, but maybe focus on a particular example and uh, I think a relevant example for maybe some physical applications. Uh, so let me just kind of remind you of a big picture that came up in Owen's talk, which is that the uh, observables of a quantum field theory define a factorization algebra. So uh, he talked about kind of a, a very nice simple quantum field theory, the beta gamma system in uh, two complex dimensions and studied its factorization algebra. And we saw that, uh, we saw that so for instance, uh, the beta gamma system, and we saw that uh, we, were, we were thinking about symmetries, symmetries of a QFT, which themselves were also measured by some factorization algebra. This is what he called uh, the quantum and classical currents. Um, and symmetries of a QFT implemented themselves as a, as a map of factorization algebras to the observables of a factorization algebra like that. And this was this version of the Noether map here. So uh, in my talk today, my talk, I'm going to show how the, these higher dimensional, higher dimensional current algebras, current algebras, which we choose to uh, represent as factorization algebras most of the time, actually appear themselves as the observables of some quantum field theory. So these appear as observables. So I'd like to distinguish this from <coughs> their appearance in the previous talk in which they appeared as actual symmetries. Now I'm saying they appear as honest observables of a, of a quantum field theory. And I'm going to choose to focus on a very specific example, but um, hope to maybe give a general picture as well. So um, so first I'd like to maybe state the kind of object that I'd like to focus on. And uh, this, this thing kind of mysteriously came up in, in Owen's talk, but maybe I'll say a few more words about it. Um, but for any, for any dimension, this is a complex dimension. Uh, so this is over C. Uh, say D and any element, any element theta, this is going to be a symmetric polynomial of order D plus one on G, and it's also going to be G invariant. One can define, one can define a non trivial extension extension of Lie algebras, um, actually DG Lie algebras, um, of the following form. So you take your Lie algebra G and you consider tensoring with the commutative algebra that uh, basically looks like the, the space of sections of punctured affine space. So this is a punctured algebraic affine space in D dimensions. So we have some non-trivial extension of this form. I'll label it by D and theta, like that. <sighs> Except you need to do something really, really important. You don't just want to consider sections or functions on derived affine space. So these are sections of the trivial bundle, right like this. Just functions on punctured affine space. If you don't, if you just leave it like this, there's no interesting non-trivial extensions. What you really need to do is look at the derived space of sections. So uh, this Lie algebra was first considered by uh, uh, Owen mentioned in the work of uh, Fante, Penion, and Kapranov. And they talked about a lot of really nice relationship between um, this extension and the uh, moduli of G bundles in arbitrary dimensions. And for me, I really want to think about it as kind of the right higher dimensional analog of the affine algebra, affine Katz-Moody algebra in CFT. So this, this algebra will come up and play a fundamental role in my uh, description 
of these uh, of uh, certain algebra observables. But uh, I just wanted to kind of recall uh, this object was floating around in the background during Owen's talk. Okay. Um, and maybe I should say the uh, maybe I should write down the formula. So the formula for this extension definitely came up. <coughs> So the, uh, the corresponding two cos cycle, the two cos cycle just took a, a tuple of, of elements inside of this algebra here, this Lie algebra. This is a DG Lie algebra now. And mapped it to this uh, higher residue like looking class. So it looks like uh, uh, you use the Lie algebra uh, polynomial to pair off the the algebra parts, and then you apply this higher dimensional residue along the 2D minus 1 sphere to uh, that form there. <coughs> so we have a really explicit model for this DG Lie algebra as an L infinity algebra, if you like, given uh, where the D plus 1 bracket, uh, D plus 1 operation is given by this formula there. Okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you how this DG Lie algebra actually appears inside of some higher dimensional gauge theories, but to give you a, a flavor for the style of higher dimensional gauge theories I'll talk about, I'll first uh, give an example. Um, so the, these, these higher dimensional gauge theories, or higher dimensional theories in any dimension, are what I want to call holomorphic, holomorphic field theories. So uh, just as an example, um, there's, a very, there's a very natural uh, field theory that I want to call holomorphic, and this is holomorphic Chern Simons theory on a Calabi Yau threefold. Uh, call that Calabi Yau threefold X here. And I'm going to let uh, omega be the non vanishing top form, holomorphic top form. Then the fields, the fields of this holomorphic Chern Simons. Are just going to be uh, zero comma one forms on X with values in some Lie algebra, G. So it looks very similar to Chern Simons, except I'm not just looking at all one forms; I'm looking at zero comma one forms. And the action, the action is very familiar as well. So uh, I take my ordinary kind of Chern Simons action, uh, uh, write it like this: one half. Uh, a d a plus one third a bracket a a like this, and I wedge with the uh, holomorphic three form. So here I've I've chosen a, a, a non-degenerate pairing on my Lie algebra G to write this down, just like you do in Chern Simons. So uh, why do I want to think about this as a holomorphic theory? Well. Its solutions to the equations of motion um, generically define, um, depend on some interesting complex structure uh, on the underlying objects involved. So for instance, this example, the equations of motion exactly pick out the holomorphic, holomorphic uh, G bundles. In this perturbative description, I'm just describing um, deformations of the trivial holomorphic G bundle on X, um, but you can do this near any, any holomorphic G bundle as well. Okay. Uh, write it like this. But this is the general kind of flavor of theories that I have in mind when I say holomorphic, when I say holomorphic field theory. Uh, we saw another example. Uh, there's, so there's a slew of examples in physics, and many will come up during the talks this week. But in physics, um, holomorphic field theories generically arise as twists of many supersymmetric field theories. Um, this is kind of a generic fact uh, for any supersymmetric field theory. Um, and Owen actually did an example of this. So this, uh, for instance, this uh, beta gamma system, system he talked about on C2. 
say, where uh, the complex manifold is C2. This came from a really simple um, supersymmetric theory that's n equals 1 uh, chiral multiply, free chiral multiply. And the example I'll focus on today also arises in this way. Um, okay. Maybe I'll go over here. Okay. So maybe I'll state my uh, kind of the main result, and then we'll get into the details. So theorem. So the the type of supersymmetric theory I'll consider is five D n equals 1, super Yang-Mills theory. And the first claim that I won't spend too much time on is that this theory admits a twist to a uh, 5D gauge theory. Uh, maybe I'll say holomorphic. Put holomorphic in quotation marks for now. Gauge theory. Um, on C2 cross R. Um, and I can actually put this gauge theory on this manifold C2 cross R bigger than or equal to zero. So now this, this is a five manifold with boundary. Um, and if you don't know anything about supersymmetric field theory or super Yang Mills, you could just start with this description of this 5D holomorphic gauge theory. So itself has a nice mathematical description. There's some uh, natural objects that pop out of the uh, equations of motion here that I'll talk about in a minute. And by holomorphic, I'll just say it's kind of holomorphic in the maximal sense here. So it depends holomorphically in this direction, the C2 direction, and then it has some topological direction in the transverse direction. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I mean by holomorphic. So it doesn't exactly fit in the style that I showed here. But what I show is that uh, there's a boundary condition, so that is a theory on C2 cross 0. It's a boundary condition of this. 5D, uh, 5D gauge theory, so now it exists just on the C2 guy, um, whose boundary observables, so the observables, observables on C2 are equal to the uh, higher dimensional uh, katz moody current algebra. Um, that Owen introduced in his talk. So uh, this higher dimensional current algebra, as we just kind of recalled up there, uh, this depends on, depends on, uh, sorry, so for some, for some element. So to really specify what I mean by Katz Moody, I need to specify some deg three, degree three polynomial, some three G dual inside of G there. And uh, I'll say what it is for this example. Um, so it's, you can think about this as being kind of like a higher dimensional version of the level in ordinary Katz Moody. So what it's saying is that the uh, what this result is saying is that the boundary to some 5D gauge theory, there appears a higher dimensional Katz Moody at some non-trivial um, with some non-trivial central extension labeled by this theta. And I'll say what that theta is for this example um, later in the talk. So any questions on on this? statement so far. So, that, so that's the general direction we're going to go in. Yeah, but if you consider the usual topological terms in dimension 3, and the boundary it also use homomorphic structure. Yeah, so I'll, I'll recall that. Yeah. What's that? But in a, a usual kind of classical story, yeah. besides there's no complete direction at all. It's pure topological inside, but on boundary it's homomorphic. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so here it's not even topological. You're right. Yeah, there's still some really some holomorphic. But even in, uh, even in Chern-Simons, there's kind of a critical version of Chern-Simons that is not topological. And even there, you do see kind of critical level Katz Moody. So I'll say a word about that. Yeah, maybe I'll recall the. So I, I do like to think about this as the uh, kind of higher dimensional extension of a very well-known correspondence between Chern-Simons theory and WZW, chiral WZW. Um, and I'll, I'll say a few words about that now um, just to um, set, ourselves, set ourselves up. So example, so ch this is Chern Simons on, um, well Chern Simons makes sense on any three manifold, um, and I'm going to do it on 
a three manifold width boundary of the following form. So here, sigma is some Riemann surface. That. And of course, we know what the fields with respect to this decomposition I can write as the following. So A looks like uh, AZ DZ plus AZ bar DZ bar. So those are just the, these are just local coordinates on the Riemann surface. Z and Z and Z bar. And I'll write T for the topological direction, or for the R direction, plus uh, AT DT, where all of the components are just smooth functions. And at T equals zero, at T equals zero, there exists a boundary condition. And what it does is it takes A. So when I evaluate at T equals zero, of course, this component goes away. And the boundary condition specifies, it projects onto one of the two components here. And the one I'll choose to project to is uh, AZ DZ. So only the, I'm only remembering the kind of holomorphic component of the uh, connection on the boundary. And it's this boundary condition that gives rise to um, the chiral WZW model on sigma. Yeah. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll just say a very, very modest extension of this. Um, which is the formalism that we like, that we like to work in, um, we can kind of reformulate this, reformulate in the BV formalism, which doesn't really buy you much new kind of structure in this 3-2 example, th this 3D-2D example, but is very relevant for the um, five-dimensional 4D example that I've stated in my theorem. So I'll just say it in this Trent Simons case. Um, the fields. The fields in Chern Simons, well, they th just look like the Duram forms on the three manifold with values in the Lie algebra. Um, and I can write that with respect to this decomposition in the following way. So it looks like, um, uh, so maybe I'll just write that. So it just looks like star forms sigma cross r bigger than or equal to zero with values in the Lie algebra. And uh, since I really want uh, gauge fields in degree zero, I need to shift this down by one. And then with the uh, complex structure on the Riemann surface, I can write this as uh, zero star forms on sigma tensor width star forms, just all forms on R plus tensor G. So that's one component. And then I have an extra component coming from the uh, holomorphic part in the Riemann surface direction. So that's one comma star forms on sigma tensor forms on R tensor G. Like that. And of course, there's a connecting map here that's just given by the holomorphic um, Duram differential on the Riemann surface that maps a zero star form to a one star form. So I can rewrite the, I'm just rewriting this Duram complex in terms of this more complex notation, this holomorphic notation. Um, but in this notation, if I write, uh, so I'm going to write my new fields kind of as a, uh, let me write them as like alpha zero comma star and alpha one comma star. So I'm writing zero comma star for an element up here and an element down there. The boundary condition that just extends that boundary condition to this full BV space of fields is really simple still. So it just says that uh, alpha at t equals zero. So alpha I'm just writing as the, this two component object at t equals zero is exactly alpha one comma star. So locally, which if you want to look at, say, the local operators of chiral WZW, <coughs> this isn't really telling you anything more. This BV formula doesn't tell you anything more because locally there's no interesting higher cohomology um, for the local operators. So everything is still concentrated in degree zero. And we just have functions, the operators in the boundary just look like functions on this holomorphic connection there. 
Uh, but we'll see in the higher dimensional example, it's really necessary for memory to remember the derived directions. So the higher uh, Dolbo directions on the boundary. Uh, okay. Any questions on this? Okay. So maybe just some remarks on this uh, perspective. So some remarks. So in this uh, BV approach, in our approach to QFT, um, developed by uh, Kevin Costello and Owen Gilliam, as I re recalled in the beginning of this lecture, um, the observables form a factorization algebra. So in particular, the, uh, the observables on the boundary of uh, Chern Simons form a factorization algebra, algebra on sigma. So we get some factorization algebra on sigma. And locally, locally on sigma equals c, this recovers the uh, affine Katzmudi, Katzmudi vertex algebra. And uh, the factorization homology evaluated on uh, closed surfaces recovers the conformal blocks of the vacuum of the vacuum Katzmudi. So it's kind of what you would expect from this uh, Chern Simons OBW picture. We're not getting anything really new, anything new there, but it's nice that it fits into the framework. Um, and there's also the issue about level. So uh, kind of a subtle issue is that uh, if Chern Simons, if Chern Simons is level, level K in the bulk, so classically if you assume that we, we have a fixed invariant pairing and we're fixing the level to be K, then the Katz Moody algebra, algebra has level K plus some shift call it Kc, and this is the uh, critical level. So that on the boundary, we don't naively would expect just to see Katzmudi at that same level. Katzmudi is also an object that depends on some level. But quantum mechanically, we don't see just the level K, but we see some shift in the level. And this is something that's generated really, if I was being uh, careful here, I would put an H bar in front of Kc. So this is really something that's a one loop effect. It's generated at one loop. Um, and there's kind of a nice diagrammatic picture implementing this, uh, implementing this phenomena. And that's to consider the operator product. So if I put two local operators in on the boundary, this is my boundary Riemann surface. And uh, we have this real direction, r bigger than or equal to zero. This critical level is generated by some one loop diagram and it's of the following form. So uh, what you do is you flow it to the bulk um, via the propagator, and there's some one-loop diagram that's really simple. It's a two-vertex wheel, and you show that this thing is uh, this thing is proportional to the critical level um, times some times some local functional um, local function in the fields that exactly incorporates the uh, central central extension of the Katz-Moody algebra. There. So the sense this thing is one loop, you usually write. We keep track of h bar if we're careful. So this this critical level is a quantum shift. I want to I really want to stress that because there's a there's a similar shift that happens in my my example that I'd like to think of kind of the critical critical level and um, appropriately uh, contextualized in higher dimensions. Okay. Um, my last remark about this. So my last remark is that there's also an extension, extension of these, of this boundary condition to um, what we call chiral boundary conditions, chiral boundary conditions for a wide class of topological, of 3D topological field theories 
um, that are labeled by labeled by a uh, what's called a geometric object called a Cron algebra. So uh, these three D TFTs uh, will be talked about. So by the way, this this uh, kind of work here, uh, thinking about generalizations of this boundary recognition for more general 3D TFTs is joint with uh, Pavel Safranov. Um, and Pavel will talk about uh, this example in much more detail in his talk. Uh, but I should say that the, the observables, the boundary observables in this case, recover a lot of other well-known um, vertex algebras or factorization algebras, uh, most notably the uh, chiral differential operators and chiral Duram complex, as well as many, uh, as well as many others that are kind of um, um, variants of those um, vertex algebras there. Um, so I won't, I won't say too much about that, just to stress the fact that uh, in this kind of degenerate limit where I take a, so a Cron algebra is something like a vector bundle that lives over some manifold, and you can think about the uh, 3D TFT as basically labeling maps from a three manifold into X together with some linear data like sections sections over the pullback of this bundle, um, roughly speaking. But in the case that X degenerates into a point, um, these boundary conditions like the chiral WW exactly become these uh, chiral boundary conditions here. So it gives a nice kind of uh, systematic relationship between CDOs and the um, katz moody algebras, if you like. Okay. So yes, Pavel will talk much more about that later. I just want to kind of Say a word about it and how it fits into this setup. Okay. So maybe I'll so now I wanted to move on to the uh, Actually, the main uh, part of my talk, which is to introduce this 5D gauge theory that witnesses the, these higher katz moody algebras on the boundary. So the, the input data I'm going to start with is x. x is going to be a, a complex surface. which I'm actually going to assume, um, just for simplicity, is Calabi Yau. So I have a, a top form uh, a top form, an degenerate top form. Um, this, this condition is not necessary. It just makes the uh, theory easier to write down. Um, You'll probably see an obvious way of getting rid of this, getting rid of this restriction. And the fields are going to look very close to a Chern Simons theory, <coughs> but I'll write them like this. So there's there's two there's two components to the fields A and B. So A uh, so I'm going to label I'm going to label x locally as uh, z1 and z2. Those are going to be my holomorphic coordinates, and a is going to look like a zero one form. So a z1 bar d z1 bar plus a z2 bar d z2 bar. And then there's a third component that labels well you can you can think about it the time direction if you like, but some other uh, real direction t. So here all of the a uh, Z bar I, A T. So these are all fields. There, this is a five-dimensional theory. These are all functions, C infinity functions on X cross R. Uh, I could choose any real one manifold, but I'm just going to look locally in the transverse direction for now. <coughs> and then B is uh, very similar, um, except these things are all proportional to the top form, like this. And then similarly, I have a decomposition like this.
and the, the b c bar i's and b t's are also just smooth functions on x cross r. The only, re the only way b's are different is they have this extra factor of the Clavier form floating around. And then the action is really easy to write down. It's uptrend Simon's type. Looks like this. So there's a kinetic term that looks like. So again, so G here, X is a complex surface. G is the same kind of data you get in Schrein Simon. So it's a Lie algebra, ordinary Lie algebra with a uh, invariant pairing. And I'll use that invariant pairing just like I do in terms of time is to write down the action. Uh, so that's the kind of ordinary kinetic term. D here just represents the Durham differential on x cross r. Um, and the interaction part just looks like b, so it's linear in b in the second component, and uh, brackets A with itself. And you don't use cubic polynomial at all? Yeah. Um, it's, it's cubic in the total sense. It's cubic as a function of both B and A. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, B, B and A kind of play similar roles here. So I want to double the algebra and get cubic invariant cubic symmetry. Yeah, that's right. Does it transform uh, the same way in the gauge transformation? The action, I just, I'm wondering if they... So the gauge transformations are exactly... So... I should say that the, so the equation of motion, what does it say? You can work this out. So for A, for A at least, um, what it tells you is that you have a holomorphic, holomorphic, uh, G bundle on on uh, X and uh, uh, together with a flat that is flat in the R direction. Okay. So if you like, you can think about this as saying I have a flat family of holomorphic G bundles on X. So the this R direction just coincides with like an ordinary trend Simon's direction, it's flat. It gives a topological direction in the field theory. Um, so it's, it's like saying I have a flat family, but I have some interesting G bundles on the X direction there. Um, so the gauge transformations you can understand as saying, well, I can always uh, perform ordinary gauge transformations in the R direction just by a flat connection, the ordinary gauge transformation of a flat connection, but then I can perform holomorphic gauge transformations in the X direction. Does that, does that help? Okay. And similarly for B as well. So it's very fair you get one dimensional correlation transversal homomorphism. You can think about it like that. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, question? Yeah. So the variation over B gives equation for motion for A and, and for A gives for B, B and for B to kind of contribute very well. Yeah. yeah, B it's not yeah, it's not so easy maybe to interpret. Yeah. So for A is that it's uh, this uh, semi flat uh, Shouldn't be dA plus commutator A in the yeah. action? Isn't it uh, one half in the second term? Oh, this is one half. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so it's like BF theory or something. And this is not. This is not. Yeah. There's no, I, I just mixed up my factors. Thanks. Yeah, this is like a BF theory. Yeah. Okay. What if you don't consider like separate fields A and B, but uh, write the same action when just using the A field? Like if you say that B is only the large A? Just as a function of A. So writing it that way, you can arrive at more interesting, there's like more interesting deformations you can write down in this theory um, that are, yeah, that, that's easier to interpret in that language. Um, but for the boundary conditions I write down, it's a little easier to think about as like two components like this. Um, but that, yeah, that's certainly something you can do. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure it'll play such relevance in my talk today, but yeah. Okay. Um, so, so Owen, Owen mentioned uh, kind of a nice computational result 
of these types of holomorphic theories that I've considered. Now, this is not exactly a holomorphic theory. It's really like holomorphic plus one theory. I have this holomorphic structure in two directions, but then I have this topological structure. But this kind of normalization result still applies. So I'll just write it. Uh, so this, this follows some, uh, some calculations I did in my thesis, uh, modest extensions thereof. But there exists a one loop um, actually finite quantization of this theory, of this 5D theory. Um, at least on flat space. <coughs> and the uh, main result I'm going to um, state today is a, is a property of this one loop um, quantization. Okay. And by finite, I mean, uh, so as it mentioned in the last talk, finite, I mean um, the Feynman diagrams we write down are strictly finite without the introduction of counter terms. So there's a really nice kind of um, explicit quantization you can write down for this class of holomorphic theories, even if they're not exactly holomorphic, but kind of maximally holomorphic. Okay. okay. So the next thing I want to do is to uh, consider this 5D theory, not just on this open space, but now on uh, a five manifold with boundary. And actually, sorry, maybe before I do that, uh, I'll just remark then, there's an extension, extension in the BV formalism. So this is going to be really important for my, my result. Um, so here, we have two fields, alpha and beta. So here, alpha, the zero component of alpha, or the degree zero part of al alpha zero is what I was calling A over there, the degree zero part of beta is what I'm calling B. So I'm just going to write down all of the um, ghosts and anti-fields together in this BV language. They look like this. So you have a, a zero star form on X. This again works for any um, complex surface, but I'll really be focusing on C2. So it looks very similar to this Trent Simons that I wrote down in three dimensions. There's a nice way of thinking about this in the BV formalism. Well, this top thing, if I forget about the shift, that's just a DG Lie algebra, right? Lee, G is a Lie algebra, and I'm tensing with a commutative algebra. The differential is this D bar plus this Durham differential in the R direction. The bottom line is clearly a module for that DG Lie algebra, where I just act by the adjoint action and then by the wedge power of forms. So when I'm running down, um, when I write down the action of the BV formalism, I just use that structure that of a DG Lie algebra in the top, and the bottom thing is a module for it. So that's why it generically has this BF type, um, BF type formula, why the action looks like that. Okay. And maybe I'll just claim, uh, I'm not going to uh, go into too much detail here, but the claim is that the uh, 5D Super Yang Mills, n equals one. Super Yang Mills admits a twist to this uh, 5D theory on uh, C2 cross R. So if you like, I'm describing the holomorphic twist of uh, 5D n equals one in this BF language. Um, this perspective is not really important for my talk, so I just wanted to state that as a kind of motivation, maybe for considering this class. Wait, when you say apply the integral to one, where's the so you just write down the bosonic field and there's ah. only some fermionic So something happens in the twisting? The fermionic direction gets twisted into a cohomological BRST direction. Okay. So a lot of the fermions that were present in this n equals one theory actually became ghost and or anti fields and antifields in this theory here. Okay. 
Yeah. So there's no Z2 grading in this. There's no firm, there's no parity here. There's just a total BRST grading. Yeah. So this is five D integral one with uh, two no matter. Or? No matter. Yeah. Just pure. Yeah. And if you add matter, is, is there a similar twist there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be throwing in some representations down on this side. Yeah. OK, so maybe I'll write down. Um, so there is a boundary condition. That t equals, oh, so for the theory on uh, C2 cross r bigger than or equal to 0 now. So I'm putting the 5D theory here. I'm looking at the boundary. equals 0. And what I do is I take this uh, two-component field at t equals 0, and I just project out to one of the components. So I just project out alpha to 0, and then beta, the field beta, at t equals 0. Keep that up. So, what do I, some really basic things I can extract from this. So clearly the operators then on the boundary, the boundary operators, the boundary operators are boundary observables. Well, they only depend, they only depend on beta. There's no alpha terms by the boundary condition there. And we can write down a um, kind of a generating basis for the local operators in the following way. So I'm going to call these, I'm going to label these things, I'll call it O for operator. Um, it's labeled by X, which is going to be an element of the Lie algebra. It's going to be a vector, integer vector, uh, uh, what am I calling it? N, like this. So N is just a two-component vector, N1 and N2, and integers, positive, non-negative integers. And then W, this is just going to be a point on C2. So it's a local operator, so it's supported at a point. That's where the observable is supported at. And what it does is it just takes beta T2Z. So that's, uh, this is something now that lives, this is not in BRST degree 0. It's in some non-trivial BRST degree, according to my conventions. I'll say what I mean by that in a minute. But it takes something like this. So here beta is just a, Beta is just a function. Beta is just a function on uh, C2. And it maps it to the following. So I take, uh, I take beta, I pair it with x. Sorry, so beta is an element. It, yeah, thanks. It's a Lie algebra valued function on, the, on C2. So I just pair it with my Lie algebra pairing. Um, now this is just a, a function, and I take its derivative d by dz1 n1 times, d by dz2, n2 times here. And evaluate at w. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks. So notice, really important, um, it was really necessary for me to be working in this um, BV setting, or else I wouldn't have seen anything interesting, because uh, these have all these all have degree. This has BRST degree, degree plus one, because beta d2z. If you look back to my formula there, that thing lives in BRST degree z, uh, minus one at level of field, so the operator's degree plus one. It gets flipped. Okay. 
So I want to check as my first check. For my, uh, my main result to have any, uh, have any chance of being true, I want to check that these local operators that I've given here agrees with the description of the, uh, of the state space of this higher dimensional katz moody algebra that we wrote down in the last lecture here. So remember for the uh, higher dimension, dimensional katz moody algebra, uh, factorization algebra on C2. Let's just recall what it is. Well, it takes any, uh, any open set inside of C2 and it maps it to some Lie algebra homology looking guy. So it looks like the Lie algebra homology of zero comma star forms compactly supported, that was really important, on U with values in G. Like that. And classically, this is exactly it. Um, there's also, uh, which we'll see quantum mechanically, there's the, it gives rise to an extension of this. We don't just look at least Lie algebra, we look at an extension of it. Uh, let me just work classically for a moment now to see that the operators agree. Um, so on, on U equals all of C2, if U is just all of C2, we can just calculate uh, Back supported functions on C2, values in G. So this looks like some uh, big symmetric algebra on compact supported Dolbo forms on C2. Tensor G shifted up, shifted down by one. And then there's some non-trivial differentials. There's the linear part of the differential that's D bar acting on the zero star part. And then there's some Lie algebra part, chevalier amberg part acting there. Um, so why does this look good? Well, first, first is, uh, zero star C on C2 um, has cohomology only in degree plus two. So it only has cohomology in degree H2 D bar of uh, C2. So this thing's actually, uh, this thing's quasi-isomorphic to this. Uh, Back supported. If you like, this is some like ser duality. Um, but I want to choose to identify this. I want to uh, I want to identify inside of here a really nice subspace. A, in fact, a dense subspace via a higher via a higher dimensional uh, version of the residue pairing. So this is, if you like, you can think about this as the residue pairing. And the space I'll write down is the following. So you look at a. You look at two holomorphic two forms on the disk, on the two disk, dual. So why would you expect this to be a, a higher residue pairing? Well, what I do is I take a, uh, so, sorry, maybe I should. So I want to I wanna, uh, think about this as, being isomorphic to the following uh, Laurent polynomial like looking space. So I look at kind of the purely negative Laurent tails in polynomial variables Z1 and Z2 inverse. And then all I do to make this dense embedding is I take a polynomial, uh, say it looks like Z1 minus M1 minus 1, Z2 minus M2 minus 1. And I map it. I map it. So maybe I should say, maybe I'll describe this one first. Sorry. 
which is getting a little. So I map this to some compactly supported uh, Dobo form, and I do this using the um, Bachner Martinelli kernel. So maybe I'll, I'll say what I mean by that in a minute, but this Bachner Martinelli kernel plays the same role as the kind of uh, residue class inside of inside of ordinary uh, complex one-dimensional complex geometry. So it sends it to the following. You look at uh, d bar applied to uh, z1 minus m1 minus 1, z2 minus m2 minus 1, um, all times the Bachner Martinelli kernel there. Uh, and I need to choose a compact support. Yeah. So I choose any. Yeah, thanks. Where, uh, where, yeah, thanks. Where f, f is any compact supported function. Smooth function. Um, if you like, this, this identification here is more uh, kind of fruitful to think about. So maybe I'll just say a word about this. In the function, just identity near zero, yeah? Cook the one near zero. And yeah, around, uh, yeah, so centered around zero, yeah. So I want it to be uh, radially symmetric, right? Uh, maybe I'll say, so this identification is a little easier. I should have started with this. Um, but all I'm doing is taking a, a polynomial of this form, so z1 minus m1 minus 1, z2 minus m2 minus 1. Uh, this maps to a thing that takes in a, um, so eta here is any polymorphic two form on the disk, and it maps it to the residue around S3, so it's this higher dimensional residue of uh, dz1, uh, m1, dz2, m2 of the Bachner Martinelli kernel times uh, eta, like that. So this, this is the kind of unique thing, uh, this residue of around S3 of omega dm uh, with any uh, with any uh, function f d two z, so if I choose a let me just choose a basis for holomorphic uh, top forms. This is just the value at f at zero. There, so I'm, I'm I'm just kind of floating around a lot of variables here. But uh, the kind of thing I really want to identify is these purely negative Laurent polynomials, which I'm identifying via a residue pairing with the uh, kind of linear part inside of this uh, factorization algebra here. Um, so, um, keeping those formulas on the board above, we see that there's a natural identification with the uh, local operators I wrote down for the boundary in the following way. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Is that good? So I just take a, uh, I, I just do kind of the natural thing. C1 minus M1 minus 1, C2 minus M2 minus 1, um, with values in x. So this is an element inside of, I'm viewing it as an element inside of compact supported forms on C, C2. Um, so it's a zero two form the way I'm identifying it, tensor G. And this is placed in degree plus one as well, right? Because uh, this thing was concentrated in cohomological degree two. So uh, two minus one is one, so this is in degree plus one. And it sends it to this operator O x comma m at uh, zero. I've, I've chosen to 
center everything around zero for this example. So this shows that the, uh, at least classically, classically the local operators coincide. Um, now at the at the quantum level, it turns out to be simplest to compare kind of a, um, a piece of this. So I haven't actually talked anything about the factorization product structure here. I've only evaluated on a disk and shown that they coincide as vector spaces or really as Cochain complexes. Um, so I'd really like to say that the factorization algebra structures are compatible on both sides. That would be kind of the strongest version of this result. Um, unfortunately, there's not really an efficient way to write down the full OPE structure for a higher dimensional holomorphic factorization like this. This would be like the idea of generalizing power algebras to arbitrary dimensions. Um, so a full kind of definition has not yet been written down in totally algebraically satisfying terms. But there is a related object um, that gets back to the first object I wrote down here. We can study, we can compare uh, what are called the mode algebras mode algebras of higher katz mooney and the boundary boundary operators. So what do I mean by the mode algebra? So before we were looking at C2 sitting inside of uh, uh, C2 cross um, R bigger than or equal to zero at the boundary. Um, what I'm going to do is um, not look at uh, all of C2, but just look at C2 minus the point. And if you like, in the, in the 5D theory, what I'm doing is looking at C2 minus the point cross R. And um, this map came up in Owen's talk. What I'm going to do is take the radial projection of the C2 minus the point. So just look at the modulus. So this produces some real number. And then in, s in here, at the level of the gauge theory, I can think about this as doing, I'm compactifying the gauge theory to r bigger than 0 across r, uh, sorry, r bigger than or equal to 0. So this really looks like some, uh, this is like a compactification along S3, if you like. So since I had a, uh, I have some holomorphic factorization algebra here, there, when I push forward, I get some factorization algebra that turns out to be, or at least has a dense subspace, just as in this uh, description right here, to actually be locally constant. Um, and I can state now my main theorem in more precise terms. So this locally, this locally constant, this locally constant 1D factorization algebra um, defines defines an uh, associative, or really it defines an A infinity algebra. Algebra, uh, I'll call it. Let me just call it A. And we have the following theorem. Um, there's an isomorphism, or there's a quasi-isomorphism. Isomorphism of A with the, uh, well, first, there's a quasi-isomorphism of A with the, uh, I do the same exact construction, not just for the boundary theory, but I can do this for the, this higher dimensional, this higher um, katz moody algebra on C2. So the first claim is that there's a um, quasi-smorphism there where I take it, I'm taking the same construction. I'm looking at the S3, back to following along S3. Um, and this has some uh, uh, with central extension extension given by uh, theta equals, now I'm going to write down some explicit polynomial. Well, you look at uh, G in the adjoint, you take its character and project onto the third component. So this is some element inside of uh, 
sim 3 g dual g. So precisely, we see the higher cat's muni at this extension, at this level here. Um, and in turn, uh, this is related, this is work that Owen was talking about in his talk. This is related explicitly to this algebra of Fante, um, Henyon, and Kompranov. Um, this is given by the enveloping algebra of this g hat 2 comma uh, theta, which extends this uh, derived version of functions on the punctured affine plane with values in g. Um, so explicitly, we've identified then the algebra, really an algebra of observables. It came from just a piece of the observables, namely the S3, the S3 modes, but we've identified a piece of it with this very explicit um, A infinity algebra like this. Um, so uh, maybe I will, I'll say one word because I wrote down the picture earlier. So the, the picture that you should have in mind, why this extension comes from. So it doesn't come from a, a So I have this big kind of space here, the C2, in some real direction. But I'm really just projecting. It's punctured. This is C2 minus the point. I'm projecting onto just the line, right, R bigger than 0. And I think about the bulk as being labeled by another copy of R. And uh, the way this extension arises is not from, like in the ordinary cat's moody, was a correction to a two-point function, this two-point OPE. It arises as a correction to a three-point function, which is really like an A infinity structure um, set in these uh, more homotopical algebra terms. And the three-point function arises as computing a diagram where you put in local operators in this one-dimensional direction, which correspond to like sphere operators up here, computing their three-point OPE, or factorization algebra structure maps. And it's corrected by some Feynman diagram that looks like this. So it's very similar to this. Uh, 3D, 2D correspondence where you see a two vertex wheel. This time you see a three vertex wheel um, labeled by the propagators like in Owen's talk. Um, and this thing you show is basically proportional to this CH3 of G in the adjoint, like that. Uh, OK, so maybe I'll, I'll stop there. Other questions? Do you know what the E2 algebra is acting on this? Which E2 algebra? The one coming from the bulk. Um, or maybe it's not E2, but is there some kind of? It, no, no, it is going to be E2. Um, no, I don't. <coughs> should be workable. Yeah, we should be able to work it out. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, yeah. Question. Yeah, if you start with this invariant cubic polynomial in the algebra, you can also build five dimensional pure topological theory, yeah? Uh, and of Chern Simons. Um, so that way, yeah. Just integrate, imagine five dimensions boundary, six dimensions. So add a full Chern Simons term to the. Yeah, yeah. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And yeah, it looks a little bit more than what you considered, yeah, but is it true? I think nobody knows what, what to do here in the theory because in trivial connection, you get no quadratic term at all. Oh. Yeah, it's like, like integral, uh, like for a, in a billion cases, integral one form, yeah. a times d, d, d a squared. Oh, I see, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's also kind of five dimensions. This theory should kind of degenerate into that theory, maybe. Yeah, it's uh, pure topological. It's yeah. Not yet, yeah. Oh, I see. That's really interesting. Yeah, I'll keep my eye on it. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, what if anything goes wrong with these, these theories in the boundary condition? You can still define if instead of having a surface, you have some high dimensional defaults. Um, and this proposition, I assume, would still have been true. I'm assuming maybe some cohomological condition on the cohomology of green algebra or something. This one on the yes, yeah. So, does something go wrong with the analog of Euclid's big analog of this theorem? In higher dimensions. Um, no, so I know an example in 7 6 works as well, um, where this like kind of six dimensional version of the higher cats mini pops up. Um, but it's very similar in structure to this, like nothing is really... There's something, does something go wrong if you just try and sort of write the same proof but replacing 2 by, by D and doing the same? Is there something that you have to... No, just interpreting as like... Uh, so I should say, selfishly, the reason I care about doing this is because it gives kind of insight into maybe seeing some dualities in physics. So I really care about this 5-4 correspondence for reasons like that. Um, but there's nothing that stops you from doing this in arbitrary dimension if you don't care about kind of relevance to other... 
maybe interesting physical theories. The 70 one's also the test of 70. That is also relevant for, yeah, that's why I've done that one too. But yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think anything should be wrong in the system. It's just, yeah, I don't know how relevant it is to other things. Yeah. Other questions? <coughs> Can I ask you about matter again? So this main, main theorem of yours, does it have an extension decision when you have matter? Yeah, so you'll see some BRST reduction of the matter and the boundary. So, I mean, I mean, it's, instead of Katsumori algebra, you mean? Yeah, you'll see like the like the higher chiral ver version of uh, BRST reduction of that module, a representation that you chose. I see. So, is is it is it easy to write? Is it easy to write it? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I could give a description. I don't know if it would be useful at all, but yeah. Okay. At least I could describe this algebra really explicitly. The algebra, the, the A infinity algebra, is really easy to write down. <laughs>